Suppose our instincts are like seeds in a garden. If my seeds stay at their proper temperature and if I give them enough water and light to survive, by that I mean if I feel safe and secure and everybody behaves the way I expect them to behave, if everybody likes me and thinks highly of me and invites me into the circle, and if I'm feeling a sense of intimacy with another person, then my seeds will grow at a reasonable rate and I'll be happy. Not much drama though. But now we're going to meet the ego. The part of me and the part of you that makes our instincts grow out of control. And in acting, we want that. The ego is the part of our mind that makes us feel separate from. Now, the brainiacs might say, well, actually, Brian, the ego is part of the personality that mediates between the unrealistic id and the external real world. Well, as an actor, I can't do anything with that. As an actor, I want you to hurt me. I actually want to find something that is going to connect me to you. I want you to have an effect on me that makes me want to do something to you in return that is going to generate emotions and then intentions about what I'm going to do to you. The stronger that connection is, the more powerful your acting will be. So, we need to get our ego to work for us. Let's simplify it and look at it this way. The ego, very simply, is that which separates me from you. It's natural and it's necessary. As we grow up, we have to have some kind of idea of our separateness that tells me I'm separate from you. I need to take care of myself. I need to put food in my mouth to keep me alive because we are two totally separate individuals in this human experience. So the ego is that which separates us. Let's picture it this way. The circle represents the universe and everything in it. All there is. There ain't no more. Inside the circle is humanity and happiness and security. Some people like to get in the circle by going to a sports event, joining a running club, dancing, going to a place of organized religion, meditating. And some people go to the theater and feel in the circle by having an experience of unity with the characters on stage. Think for a moment about what makes you feel in the circle. What makes you feel a sense of security and that things are all right in your circle, in your world? But we don't always stay in the circle, do we? When one of our instincts is threatened, remember them, the natural need for security and companionship and romance. When one of our instincts is threatened, we pop out of the circle behind this line, the ego. And here I am out here all by myself wanting to get back into the circle. I have this insatiable yearning to return to that feeling of security and happiness and harmony with the rest of humanity. I really believe that this little diagram has the ability to solve most of your problems with acting. And what I found, it can help me understand a lot of my problems with life. For instance, I'm one of those very sensitive people who can feel all alone in a crowded room, like I'm a kid outside of a candy shop just looking in. The ego tells me they're different than me. They're better than me. They like you more than they like me. And you are keeping me from getting what I want. You are a threat to me. So I feel afraid or envious or bitter. And I work even harder to get my instincts met so that I can get back into that circle. That raw, awkward, vulnerable, needy path from there to there is drama. Our killer instinct pursuit to get back into the circle. It used to make me feel pretty silly that I'm actually that needy. But the ego gets a payoff from all of this. The wonderful feeling of being right. I told you I was worthless. In order to survive the separateness, the ego needs to feel justified by squeezing the juice of righteousness out of a situation. But again, we don't like to look stupid. So one mechanism that the ego uses to protect itself is to disown any painful information and project it onto the world or other people. And here we go again, a relationship with your scene partner. How does the ego protect itself? It will criticize, idealize, moralize, hypothesize, romanticize, emotionalize, dramatize, catastrophize, rationalize, 
fantasize, intellectualize, glamorize, and demonize. The ego does all these things to reinforce its positionality of uniqueness. Now you might dismiss this idea because we like to think that we humans in the 21st century are very calm and rational and we're in control of what we think and what we do. And besides, I secretly want everybody, including the audience, to like me. If we take a long, honest look at ourselves, you and I are governed by our emotions. As actors, we better be. And in a battle between my emotions and my intellect, my emotions will always win. Why? Let's compress a million years into several seconds and look at the neuroscience. We humans have made a long, slow progression toward being who we are today. Over the course of nearly a million years, we've gone through multiple processes of evolution, mutation, selection, adaptation, competition, and failure, punctuated by the occasional success. We've only really rewired the brain in the past 50,000 years, beginning with a wide range of stone tools, objects of art, which, it has to be said, has nothing to do with our survival. It's just an expression from within us, kind of like acting. And over those short 50,000 years, we've rewired the brain to create a complex social life. To put it simply, if dad doesn't like what the child has done, all it takes is the look, and the child immediately changes their behavior. They better. But in the back of our minds, both literally and figuratively, is a remnant of the dinosaur brain that still lives within us. It gives us the fight or flight response. So another face of the ego is almost like an animal that we in the 21st century have banished from society and the ego is forced into the desert to feed on negative emotions and squeeze the juice out of them. So the ego is just like a desert animal, but you don't have to hate it. It can't help itself. When the ego flares up, try not to get angry with it. It's best to try to make friends with it and almost laugh at it. You can see the ego in action if you go to the monkey sanctuary at the zoo. You can see territorial squabbles. There's always a turf war going on somewhere. It also shows up as road rage. You see monkeys hanging out in cliques, similar to someone saying, here she comes, let's ignore her. You see dominance clawing your way up to the top of your company. You see the ambition for prestige. And somebody's always trying to grab more of the bananas. So the human ego is simply the inhabitants of a monkey sanctuary with a human expression. There's a musical that ties all this together beautifully. It takes what we've learned about the instincts and the ego and combines it with the neurology that we've already learned, our default social cognition network, remember that? It's the part of our neurology that switches on when we're at rest, that creates images and thoughts about our relationships with others. For some people, it can lead to very negative ideas. Look at the Sondheim musical Assassins, or you can find it in the anatomy of any extremist, male or female. But for a man, masculinity can be threatened by the evolving role of the male in society, leading to incorrect feelings of impotence and low self-esteem. They see other individuals as a threat, and their sympathetic nervous system, that's our fight or flight response, kicks in to confront that threat. Their social instinct seeks companionship by bonding with others who share these perceptions of threats. They have a lack of compassion due to an incorrect perception of constant threats. And their prefrontal cortex selects courses of action that will elevate their self-esteem by securing power over the perceived threat. With all these elements, we actors now have the ability to create a neuroacting nuclear weapon. Ever seen this? That's right. Einstein told us that the amount of energy in a system, an atom, a person, or a solar system, is equal to its total mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. Take an unstable mass, such as plutonium, and pound it with energy at the speed of light squared, and you get this. In acting terms, the amount of energy in a character is equal to its ego multiplied by its basic instincts in overdrive. So if you take our fragile ego and pound it with our basic instincts in overdrive, you get this. You're my type! So our formula is 
Character energy equals ego times instinct squared. Incorporate this formula into the development of your character and you will burn up the stage. With all this potential energy, I want you also to see how it can affect you and your daily life, sometimes negatively. The ego can become our inner saboteur. The ego is that little voice that feeds us the question that every actor who has ever lived, even the greats, have asked themselves, why would anyone want to listen to me? That is at the core of performance anxiety, this insecurity, this shutting down of emotions and wanting to get through the scene as quickly as possible. That belief, that self-doubt, it stands in the way of you being an artist. Because if you believe that lie, and if you then shut yourself down, what you will do in your acting is try to hide. You will try to produce not the honest results, not the truthful results, but the results that you think the audience is expecting to see from a talented actor. When we're in that destructive frame of mind, we're not creating the unity that we seek to create. We're not connecting to another person. We are basically holding the audience hostage. So knowing about our ego can help us tackle that destructive belief and begin to transcend it. The ego also affects our perspective on life and the character's perspective on their life that you're about to play. More fuel for your characterization. If you put all of these instincts and ideas and images in our minds, then add the starving ego, and then add the chaos of daily life where we come into contact with other egos, wouldn't it be kind of arrogant for me to say about life, I'm in control of this. And when I look out at the world, I see objective reality. As quantum physics says, there is no such thing as objective reality. We actually create our reality. All of our perceptions about what we think and feel and believe is going on is really being created by our previous experiences, our life lessons, our attitudes, our fears. All of these, we create our own reality by our own neurology. Want proof? If I've had a knock to my self-esteem and I'm feeling insecure and inferior, then the people whom I meet are going to be better than me, smarter than I am, more talented, braver, more likable, doing better in their careers. In the school library, Hannah finds a book about dogs. She can't wait to look at it. She then sits near Claire, who she knows is in the top of her class. Instantly, Hannah feels insecure about her choice of a book, is attacked by the ego, puts it away, and feels even more inadequacy and resentment toward Claire. My friend Steve had resentment against his wife because she spoke to him once in a demeaning way. When we looked at it, he realized that in actuality, he often feels less important than her because he works from home and she's a clinical psychologist. One day, he spoke to her in a sarcastic, demeaning way to protect his self-esteem. She retaliated, but Steve's ego then made him twist the truth to make him look better and to make her look worse. Now, why am I telling you these stories? Because self-awareness can give us immense power in our acting. It's like, if I'm in a hurry and this tells me that I don't have enough time, then the people who come into my path are driving way too slowly and I want them to get the hell out of my way. Now, in reality, their driving hasn't changed. They're still driving normally. But my perceptions have changed my universe. But the more I know about how I am creating my own universe, the better able I am to make different choices of actions and reactions. And likewise, the more you understand how you're creating your own universe, the more power you give yourself to make specific choices about how your character is creating their own universe on stage from moment to moment. The acting then becomes simple. Let that marinate in your mind because we're going to return to it. There is no objective reality. What you perceive in your daily life, you are creating by your attitudes, your memories, your life lessons, your fears and insecurities. You are creating your human experience based on all that. And forgive me if I seem to be a real critic today. Everyone does it. I do it. 
But now, that awareness gives you the power of choice to rewire your brain. And in this course, when we move toward creating a character in a performance, you will use these tools to create the new universe that your character is going to live in. And you'll create it out of just blobs on a page. Isn't that marvelous? Your job then as an actor is to look at your character and decide what is their subjective truth that they are placing on their relationships with other characters. And it helps you to learn what they want and what they think they need, which might be the opposite of what we first think. It's important to remember though that your character does not know this. Like most people, they are oblivious to the basic instincts. This is where you, the actor, are smarter than your character. And this is what can make your work fun and very powerful. If you find what instinct of your character is being threatened by the other person and then put all of your energy to getting your needs met and phrase it in such a certain way that the other character is not meeting your needs, trust me, sparks will fly. Life is difficult. And I'd say to you right now, good for you for wanting to explore your life, to start on the lifelong journey of understanding your instincts and ego. And you have tremendous courage in honestly laying it all out there for an audience to see. And let me drive home our new formula one more time. That energy is created when we combine the ego and the instincts and behavior in a high pressure situation. And that energy is called emotion. It's no wonder we humans today feel anxious and overwhelmed with all these instincts kept under pressure and our collision with other egos. We'll look at the emotions for the actor in greater detail a bit later, but for now, I want to begin to expand your emotional vocabulary when you create a character. So let's glance at the emotions so that you can identify them within yourself. In your course book, you can journal what you felt in a certain high voltage situation recently and what instinct might have been threatened. So, meet the emotions from their lowest calibration to the highest. Anger. This is sometimes our reaction to fear, especially us men. Also, we all react negatively in a situation because somebody has done something which goes against our expectations of how they should behave. Resentment. This is anger which has settled into our minds, which we then rationalize to absolve us from any responsibility on our part. Okay, I did that to you, but you did something to me two weeks ago. If I can't handle the shame, guilt, and remorse of my own actions, I'll project them back onto you to make me look good and make you look bad. Gotta protect the old ego. We're entitled to be angry for one hour. After that, it becomes a resentment. Shame, guilt, and remorse. These are awful feelings that come when we cause harm to someone else by acting on our instincts in an out-of-control way. Envy. That's what happens when I want something that you already have. Jealousy. That's when I've got something, but I'm afraid you're going to take it away from me. Fear and insecurity. That's when I'm afraid I'm going to lose something I already have or not get something that I deeply want. I'm also afraid of the unknown and what I can't control. For some people, this out of control feeling is why they're terrified of flying or spiders. Fear that's not paralyzing often leads to an action, usually manipulation of other people, which is a powerful fuel for the actor, as we see later. Pride. This is a feeling of superiority coming from the belief that something outside of me that I've achieved or acquired makes me better than you. Compassion. This is when I identify and relate to your instincts and ego, and I forgive you for hurtful behavior that was beyond your control, because I'm capable of the same behavior myself. And finally, love and joy. This is a comfortable feeling and action that comes when my basic instincts are being met and I'm in the circle with the rest of humanity. I then want to reach out and nurture you. In later lessons, we'll look closer at these emotions and how to create them through your behavior toward others and through a physical way of inducing them within yourself. But let's direct these emotions back to the playing of a character because there are two traps I see so many actors fall into and I want you to avoid them. First, the villains. No villain ever thought that they were in the wrong. 
to themselves, they were perfectly justified in their own behavior. If you don't find their justification and put it into positive action, you'll be playing at the character and you'll fill it with easy, boring, evil choices. The fun is actually in finding the villain within you. Trust me, it's there. The second trap is when actors play struggling characters and then fill them with self-pity. The trap there is that we actors can get stuck looking at a character from the audience's point of view and feel sympathy toward them. And then I can't wait for the audience to feel sorry for me. Boring. Self-pity is repulsive in real life and it has no place on your stage. Your character must have these basic instincts within themselves and they are battling to get out of their situation. Constantly, I have to get actors to stop feeling sorry for their characters and get them to fight for them in a scene. That is unless you deliberately want to play them for self-pity, but realize that's a weak choice and the audience will get tired of listening to you. The important rule is get out of the audience and get into the character's soul. From now on, everything you do is from your character's point of view, your character's perceptions, and above all, your character's needs. Doesn't matter if you think they're unsavory, go after their needs. Your audience will sit up and take notice. Why? Because they feel as needy and doubtful and hopeful as you are. Isn't it comforting to know that if you have these instincts, this ego, and these emotions, you have to ask, am I alone in this? No. We all have the same instincts, needs, desires across all countries and time periods. But most of us have not had this awareness that our brains are innocent hard drives that have software with bugs in it. So we have to feel compassion and forgiveness for these other egos and our own. We're all innocent people who are held captive by our own world view. But sometimes these conflicted people decide to come together and pay a bit of money and sit and watch someone show them what it means to struggle through this. That's our job to give dignity to that struggle and show how life and truth really is. Don't worry, they'll get it. Because your truth is the same as my truth, which is the same as my children's truth and the same as your parents' truth. The truth is the same the world over. Everyone who has ever lived has had these instincts, these character defects, these emotions, but now you know the ultimate trap that the ego puts us into thinking that I'm different. Nobody understands me. And other people have mastery over these emotions, but I don't. We're all exactly the same. We're all afraid. We're all insecure. We all feel stupid. But I'm here to tell you, it's safe. There's no need to be afraid in expressing your truth simply and sincerely, because there's no difference between us. And here's another bombshell. Old truth is the same as young truth. If that's the case, then you are the same as me, equal. Therefore, I have no reason to fear you, and you have no reason to fear anybody. What does that look to the outside world? Confidence. But what's really going on is humility and forgiveness and compassion. I have to say, though, the only drawback to knowing about these instincts is they will become objectionable to you, and you may want to do something about them. That's the human soul wanting to grow and evolve, and we'll look at some things you can do in our final lesson. But now, homework time. We've swallowed a lot of emotional medicine today. If there are any instincts or emotions that you really identified with today, you might want to write about them in your course book, especially those that really jump out at you. Just knowing about them helps us to very slowly change those hot buttons into tolerance and compassion. And we can use it in our art. The characters whom you're most attracted to, you like them because you're looking in the mirror. Then take a soul break. You can listen to some relaxing music, play an instrument, take a walk, or use the meditation that's in this lesson if you'd like. With your greater awareness about yourself and others, practice compassion. And the most important person to show compassion toward is yourself. I found that sometimes my character defects don't change by a frontal assault. So here's what I'd like you to try. And this too is leading toward acting technical skills. Tomorrow, say to yourself, just for today, I will exercise my soul in three ways. One, I will do somebody a good turn and not get found out. If anybody knows of it, it won't count. Two, 
I will not show anyone my feelings are hurt. They may be hurt, but today I will not show it. And three, just for today, I will act courteously, criticize not one bit, not find fault with anything, not try to improve or regulate anybody but myself. Try this for one day and see what emotions come from that. For our next lesson, I'd like you to find a personal object that you can hold in your hands that has a lot of meaning for you, but it shouldn't be an object that is related to any loss or trauma from your life, as this will be a powerful exercise. And finally, that's what you're going to do. Prepare the next Uta Hagen exercise. Spend some time with this because it's going to be very creative and very releasing. Your instincts will be threatened and you will fight to get back into the circle. Commit 100% to this exercise and see what happens. You'll find all the instructions in your course book and in the instructional video that's in this lesson called Hagen Exercise 3. Once again, Otsukari Sama Dishita. And I hope you've learned a lot in this lesson. Contemplate these concepts from now on, because in later lessons, we'll take that knowledge of our soul, our instincts, and our ego straight into our acting. But for now, stay beautiful, celebrate that soul, and break a leg. <laughs>